you that don't know me, my name is Jill Simmons, so I'm going to be your instructor today uh, for our Zoom Empanadas class. And a little bit uh, about my background is I've been teaching now for well over 20 years. My specialties are baking and also French cooking. And then from time to time, I team up with my husband. We do food and wine pairing classes. So we thought it'd be fun today to include Walt. Um, and you can just step in here real fast. This is my husband, Walt. Hi, everybody. And he's going to be introducing two different wines that we've selected for you um, to pair with our empanadas. So he'll be up a little bit later. And at that time, uh, we'll share a little bit more about his background. Okay, Sounds good. thanks, we'll see you in a little bit. All right, um, so I, we're gonna start then with our flaky cream cheese dough. And I wanted to mention this uh, recipe, this dough that we're making is very uh, versatile. You can use it for a lot of different uh, recipes like pies and tarts and quiches and like the empanadas that we're doing today. And this is the recipe that I used for my apple pie that I entered in the California State Fair. And it took best of division. So this is like one of my very favorite um, pastry recipes that we're, we're making today. So we asked you to mise en place your ingredients, which means to assemble or put in place. It's a French term. And for this recipe, you do need to chill your ingredients ahead of time at least a half an hour and your butter goes into the freezer. So I'm gonna start with my ingredients here. Um, I still have my butter in the freezer, but I asked you to put some flour um, in the refrigerator. I wanna show you a spoon and sweet method of measuring flour. And you have to remember baking is more of a science. So you need to be more precise, accurate in your measurements. But if you are, if you take care to measure carefully, you're then going to have consistent results. So in this recipe, it calls for, and I forgot to put on your equipment list, a one third measuring cup. So it calls for one and a third cups of all purpose flour. So I've had my flour chilling here in the refrigerator, and you can do this with me. I want you to do this with me. You're gonna be spooning your flour out of your bowl into your measuring cup. And I also had you spoon the flour, or pour the flour into a bowl. You know, you think about it when flour's in the, the sack or a canister, it settles. So this then gives our flour a chance to aerate a little bit by pouring it into a bowl and kind of stirring it up. So I'm overfilling my measuring cup. I'm going to tap the side a little bit and then you're going to take the flat edge of your knife and go ahead and level that off. So you have one cup of flour. Jill? Yes. I have a question. Yes. Um, the question is, shouldn't the flour be weighed? You can. You can weigh or do this method. I have pretty consistent results with doing the spoon and sweep method. If I double check myself and weigh my flour, it seems to be exact. One cup of flour is a little bit less than five. If I do the spoon and sweep method, it's a little bit less than, than five ounces. Thank you, Jill. Oh, Janice? Question. Uh, can I use a little bit of whole wheat flour with the all-purpose, or will that uh, change the recipe? I think you probably could, and it would give, it just would give your pastry a little bit different texture. But um, yeah, you could maybe try, try like maybe one cup and then a third of a cup. Maybe try whole wheat pastry flour. Yes, okay, good. Thank you. Uh -huh. So I've now measured my flour out into my food processor. And I wanted to talk about, I know a couple, I think one person's doing their recipe by hand, why I use a food processor. Um, and there are some advantages. By using a food processor, you're gonna get more consistent results. The metal blade actually does a better job of cutting that fat into the flour mixture. 
than doing it by hand, then you're less likely to have to use a lot of water to bring the dough together. I find with this recipe about two tablespoons, just a little more is always just right. And then the other thing is, is it's faster, it's more efficient. So we're wanting to keep those ingredients cold so we have a nice flaky pastry. You're gonna be able to make this a little faster and keep those ingredients cold. So there's some really solid advantages to uh, using the food processor. So you'll have measured out an eighth of a teaspoon of salt and an eighth of a teaspoon of baking powder. And that baking powder just helps our dough to puff a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and put the lid on here and just give this a little spin to incorporate the ingredients and just to kind of aerate the flour. So now we're ready to add our cream cheese. So this I wrapped in saran wrap and stuck it in the fridge. I just three ounces of cream cheese and cut it into uh, pieces. And what I like about the cream cheese, I've tried a lot of different um, recipes for pastry dough. Um, and what I like about this is that the cream cheese, it gives the pastry nice flavor. It browns nicely. And sometimes if you make an all butter pastry dough, it tastes really good and it can be flaky, but it can also be just a little bit tough. So this seems to be the perfect combination uh, using the cream cheese and then the butter. So this is three ounces of cream cheese. What we're going for here is we're mixing the cream cheese into the flour mixture until it resembles the consistency of cornmeal. So we're working the cream cheese all the way in to the flour. So you're gonna be pulsing here, thinking your recipe is for about 20 seconds. And what I like to do, I have a, a fork here, is just kind of check to see where I am. So open up the food processor, I'll turn the blade a little bit, and this is fairly well worked in, but I'm going to take it just a little bit further. So I'll give it a few more pulses. So, Walt, would you mind going to the freezer and getting my butter, please? So, Walt has graciously offered to be my assistant today. So let me move this out of the way. So now we're ready to incorporate our butter, which has been in the freezer for a good half an hour. I cut the butter, thank you, in three quarter inch pieces and just wrap that into saran. And I'm gonna scatter the butter over the top. Jill, I have a question. Um, Nancy's doing it by hand. Yeah. And she wants to know she's supposed to put all the cream cheese into the bowl if doing it by hand. So you'll work, yes, the, the cream cheese, um, use a pastry blender and work it in to uh, the flour mixture. You can cut it up into pieces um, so that it's a little easier to incorporate. Did I understand the question correctly? Uh, let me find Nancy if she'll unmute herself. And then you'll be out, then you'll oh, be breathing in the butter. Yeah, Nancy, go ahead. Yeah, it's cut up. I just wasn't sure if I just add it all in at once because I'm doing it differently than the food processor method. Yeah, so you can just uh, go ahead and you cut it up and then just go ahead and work it into the flour mixture all the way with your pastry blender. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm scattering my butter over the top. Now we're going to do something a little bit different here. And we uh, completely worked in the uh, cream cheese into the flour mixture. We're gonna leave the butter in bigger pieces. And the reason why we're doing that is if the butter is in bigger pieces, it's gonna help you to have a flakier pie crust. And kind of the science behind this 
is that the butter, once it goes into the oven, because it's in bigger pieces, about the size of a pea, an oatmeal flake, or the fingernail on your pinky, it's not gonna melt as fast. It acts as little spacers in the dough, and then steam has a chance to form, and it actually puffs the layers of dough apart. Similar concept to um, puff pastry. So the result is, is a really nice flaky um, pastry. Okay, and I have a question. Okay. Um, so, Skip, do you wanna ask your question? Oh, you have to unmute. There you go. Uh, no, I was just I was just going to say, is this what's meant by visible butter in the dough? Visible butter in dough. You know, that sums it up nicely. I haven't heard that before, but you definitely you'll find when you're rolling out this dough that you will be able to see little pieces of butter in the dough. The butter will be visible. Yeah, so, thank you, Skip. That was good. Yes. So you can see I still have some pretty big pieces here. I checked again with my fork and turned the blade a little, so I have a little further to go. So I'm gonna pulse a little more. Lori, or Jill, what's the technique for the butter if you're doing it by hand then? I thought you were supposed to use a grater. No? You are using a grater okay. if you're doing it by hand. Yes. Okay. I think I'm looking pretty good here. So you can still see nice pieces of butter. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add my water and my vinegar. And let me just grab my matrix here. OK, so is everybody with me? Are you guys who are using food processors? to where you're ready to add your liquid? Yeah, okay, I see a thumbs up. Thanks, Kathy. All right, so here I asked you to put some water in a liquid measuring cup with some ice, and I want you to add two full tablespoons of water and sprinkle that over the top. And then I'm gonna have, this isn't in the recipe. I actually tweaked this recipe a little bit because I wanted a little more dough for our empanadas today. And I'm finding I need just a little bit more water. Um, I increased the flour, the butter, and the uh, cream cheese from the original recipe. So let's try also adding one teaspoon of water at this point. And we'll do a little check to see if we have enough water. Um, and I'll show you what you're looking for in just a minute. So I'm gonna pulse this. You're not wanting this to come together where it's a ball of dough. I don't wanna over mix this, but I want the mixture to be moistened and I want it to start to come together. So let's take a little look here. So if I take this between my fingers, you see how it's holding together pretty nicely. I'm just gonna add a, just a, like a skosh more water to this, blend it, and then I'm gonna call it good, okay? Okay, that looks good. So this is about where you want to be. How how this should look, and you're and it looks it still looks a tiny bit crumbly, but it will come together. So I'm going to show you another little technique. Oh, I forgot. Oh, okay, I forgot my uh, vinegar, and that just helps to um, tenderize the crust. So let me mix that in. Okay. So then you should have a plastic baggie standing by. You're gonna take your pastry dough 
And I just, instead of taking the metal blade out, I just stick my finger up inside of the hole so the metal blade doesn't fall out. And then I'm going to empty the contents. Here we go. This is where I think I can do it. into my bag. And why I'm doing this is I'm going to use the bag to bring the dough together and I'm not warming it up with my hands. There we go. There, okay. All right, so then you're gonna use the bag to form a compact disc of dough. And you see how this is coming together? And you can feel that the dough is really nice and cold. So press firmly around the sides and around the top. And then I'm gonna just bring this to the middle to make it a little easier to form into a disc. That's such a great technique, Jill. Oh, good. Thank you. And we'll check with everybody who's doing the dough. Is everybody at the bag portion? Yeah? Oh, great, Gordon. Yeah, you guys are on it. Oh, good. Skip's doing it, it looks like. I think Marva's good. Rachel, you're doing good? Oh, yeah, you already did your dough. All right, how are people doing? Um... Do we still have somebody working on their dough that did it by hand or they're already done? Nancy, how are you doing? I'm still grating butter. Okay. Is there anyone else who is behind on their dough? Nope. Okay. Okay. All right, so at this point, we'll go ahead and put our dough in the refrigerator. The nice thing about this is that you can chill it for a half an hour and then roll it out. You can leave it in the refrigerator for up to three days before rolling it out. This dough freezes beautifully, so you can make some ahead and put it in the freezer. Um, if you have it in the refrigerator for a couple days, if it's pretty cold, um, let it sit for about 10 minutes before you roll it out. Or if it's in the freezer, you would take it out of the freezer, put it in the refrigerator, let it thaw out overnight. And then same thing, let it sit for about 10 minutes uh, before uh, rolling. It'll just make it easier for you to roll it out if it's really, really cold. So, I think we're at a point where everybody then is putting their dough in the refrigerator and Lori can set the timer for a half an hour. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to set out. timer for 30 yeah. minutes. We take it out if it's um, if we minutes that 30 minutes. Minutes. Oh, Rachel, say that again. If we've already put ours in the fridge, should we take it out after 30 minutes? No, just go ahead and leave it in there. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Thank you, Rachel. I'm just going to take a second to kind of clean up my uh, workstation. We won't need the uh, food processor anymore. And you can start to bring out the ingredients for uh, the filling.
forgot about the toes. I know. I was going to remind you. <laughs> I'm so used to the other way. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask us while we're getting situated. I can tell everybody that I'm very excited because I'm having empanadas and salad for dinner tonight. And so I'm a, a, the lucky recipient of this. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn to the ground chicken potato and carrot filling. And I have a saute pan here that I'm going to start warming up. Um, I want this on about medium heat. And you have about a tablespoon of olive oil. And then a half a pound of ground chicken. If you wanted to make a lot of empanadas, you can easily double uh, this filling. Uh, for the way uh, with our dough that we're making and the amount of filling that we're making, you'll probably get about 16 three inch empanadas and you'll have a little bit of filling uh, left over in this recipe. And if you didn't want to use ground chicken, you could also use ground turkey you could also use ground beef too. How about ground lamb? Yeah, I think that would be nice too. That's a really good idea, Lori. So my pan um, is starting to heat up. I'm gonna go ahead and add my oil. And then you're adding your ground chicken and in your recipe, it says to break this up into pieces and cook the ground chicken until it's cooked all the way through, but we're not really necessarily looking to brown this. So I'll get that started. And turn my heat up just a little bit more. And then you can just start kind of breaking it up. And then we're gonna be adding our um, jalapeno pepper and our onion to our ground chicken. So I asked you to go ahead and prep your jalapeno pepper. You're removing the seed and the rib. About 80% of the chili's heat is contained in the seeds in the rib. If you wanted this to be a little spicy, you could leave in some of the seeds. Um, capsaicin is the compound that gives chilies um, their heat. So I have that diced. So I wanted to give you guys um, some knife skill tips. So when I'm teaching in-person classes, I always ask students, like, do you have any tips? Like, what do you do to um, slice or chop an onion so that you don't cry? And you always hear just some crazy things like, uh, Freezing an onion, I've heard um, putting two matchsticks in your mouth, wooden matchsticks, so that you're breathing in the sulfur from the tips of the matchsticks. Walt's mom used to wear um, his swimming goggles when she would chop an onion. And I think Sir Latab has onion goggles and they probably charge like $50 for onion goggles. Well, the secret is really in the technique and also having the right tools. So if you have a good chef's knife, I'm using a larger chef's knife just because this knife um, happens to be a little sharper than my eight inch um, chef's knife. But um, I'll show you the technique that I use. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm using a yellow onion. You're gonna cut off the tip of the onion and then you're gonna go through the root end and then you can go ahead and peel back. Usually I take the first layer of the onion off. 
And then it's the sulfuric compounds that make you cry. Go ahead and set your onion down so the flat surface is on the board and then um, you're less likely to have the sulfuric compounds escape because it's flat on your board. So that's one little tip. And then it also gives you a flat surface to work with when you're chopping. So you're gonna take your onion, you're gonna make horizontal slices, take, take your hand flat on top of the onion, you're gonna make your horizontal slices, then you're gonna take the tip of your knife, vertical slices, you can go ahead and make the vertical slices fairly close together. Since we're making smaller empanadas, we're going to go for a smaller dice um, on the onions, the potatoes, and the carrots. You're going to make your claw like you see chefs doing on like Food Network. You're going to go back through and you see how you have a nice uniform dice. You can sometimes tip this in and get a little bit more. And because I'm fast and efficient in my technique, then I am less likely to cry. So same thing, horizontal. Vertical. That root ends holding all the layers together. And then you're going to go back through and do your dice at the end here. You can tip it down to get a little bit more. And there you go. So we'll go ahead and add our onion into our chicken mixture and our jalapenos. And then this is an opportunity to break that ground chicken up a little bit more. And here's our jalapeno peppers. I'm going to go ahead and wipe off my hand. So did you guys try that? Did you, did you have success in chopping your onion using that technique? Yeah? Okay, so I'm just breaking this up. This is kind of where I'm at at this point, okay? So you should be on about medium heat. I have industrial burners, so I'm having to fiddle a little bit to get the right setting. And then you can just break up your chicken. So the onions and the jalapeno peppers will, um, Go ahead and cook down with uh, the chicken here. So let's work on our next ingredients, our um, potato and our carrots. And I wanna give you some more little tips on how to prepare those. So what I'm going for is that everything has kind of a uniform dice and Things will cook more evenly if they're cut about the same size. Jill, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, they just wanted to double check. That was a half a pound of chicken, correct? Of ground half chicken. Half a pound of chicken. Yes. Um, and so the question was, it seemed to them like a lot of onion to the ratio of chicken. So I used a pretty small onion. If you can't get a small onion, then and you have a large onion, just use half. Okay. All right. So our carrots. So carrots just uh, tell you a little bit about um, selecting produce. Uh, this is a good rule of thumb uh, is that the smaller, the better, the younger, more tender. Um, so for just about any kind of produce that you're looking for. Um, so this is a nice size carrot. Um, sometimes you'll see carrots with cracks. That means that they're past their prime. And carrots are actually a member of um, the parsley family. If you do buy carrots with the greens attached when you get home, 
go ahead and take, take those off because they start to rob um, the carrots of their, their moisture if you're gonna have them on hand for a few days. So I'm not gonna peel the carrot. Um, my technique will help to take some of the, the peel off um, to get a nice dice on our carrot. I'm gonna go ahead and take the tip off and uh, the top. I'm gonna cut this in half so that you have uh, manageable pieces to work with. And then I'm gonna square off my carrot. So I'm gonna cut a little bit of the peel off. And you can see when I turn it, my piece of carrot isn't rolling on the cutting board anymore. It's more uh, stable to work with. We're gonna add salt in just a little bit. Um, once we add our uh, cumin and our tomato paste. I, sorry, Lori, I just went ahead and read the question. Oh yeah, <laughs> thank um, you. Okay, so then I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take a little bit of the peel off the second side, the third, and the fourth side. So what I'm doing is I'm squaring this off so that it's easier to work with but I can cut my carrot into planks, all right? So I have three planks now. And then I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna cut each plank into three sticks or the French would say batons. So for this first piece of carrot, I have nine, nine batons. I'm gonna do the same thing with my other piece. I'm squaring off each side. And then I'm gonna be able to get three planks out of this as well. This is a little more narrow, so I'm gonna cut each plank in half so then I excuse me, have um, six batons. So then I'm gonna gather three together. I'm making my claw. I'm gonna go ahead and go back through. And you see how I just get a really nice dice here. And I'll fold these ends together on my carrots. So we'll just keep working on this to dice our carrots. And then we're gonna do something similar for our potatoes. So since these are appetizer size empanadas, it works a little better to do a pretty small dice. That way, every little empanada has some nice pieces of um, carrot, potato, onion, and jalapeno pepper. And I'm just coming back to give my ground chicken a little stir and continue to break up some of these pieces. Okay, let me finish my carrot and we'll go on to our potato. Ow. Okay, I may have to run back and get a potato peeler, but that's okay, let me keep working. Okay, potatoes. So we're using a russet potato. You want a small potato. I'm gonna cut the ends off. I'm gonna work with my knife to remove most of the peel. And then if you need to, you can um, use a peeler to remove any little bit of um, skin that you might have left. So you see how I have more of a square now by slicing on each side, taking off the peel. Again, it's gonna be easier to work with. I'm gonna run back and try to find a peeler, okay?
So if you need to, if your chicken is pretty well cooked through, like I was saying, we don't really want this to brown. You might want to adjust the heat a little bit to turn it uh, down to low while we're finishing up our ingredients. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just take off the rest of the peel on my potato. We're using russet potatoes and you do want a starchy potato. Um, it's gonna help to thicken uh, the filling as it cooks because we're adding a little bit of um, chicken stock to this. All right, so we're gonna cut this into planks. I'd say that's probably about a quarter of an inch. And then the same thing, you're gonna cut this into your batons and then go back through. You can stack those together and do your dice. All right. So as a cooking instructor, I really enjoy learning about the history of ingredients and where ingredients come from and how they got to other places. So I'll tell you a little bit about potatoes. So it was actually the Incas who were the first to cultivate potatoes. And then it was through Spanish exploration that potatoes were brought over to Europe. But when they were first brought over because potatoes are a member of the nightshade family, Europeans thought that potatoes were poisonous. So they were afraid to eat them. And it was Sir Walter Raleigh. He had property in Ireland. And he decided that he was gonna start growing potatoes so it was around the 1600s, early 1600s, he was gonna start growing potatoes on his property in Ireland. And I guess you could say the rest is history. That then helped to debunk the notion that um, potatoes were uh, poisonous. All right, I'm almost done here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this into my ground chicken. And give this a little stir and then we'll be ready to add our cumin. I'm gonna turn this up just a little bit. There we go. And give this a little stir. All right, so we are using ground cumin in this recipe, which has kind of a smoky, nutty flavor. Uh, if you've been to the co-op before, what I really appreciate is that they have a section of bulk items, and also they have an aisle where you can buy your spices in bulk. So if you want to make sure that your spices stay really fresh, you can just buy a little bit at a time. So cumin's actually a member of the um, parsley uh, family. So you can buy it ground, or you can also buy the seeds, and you can toast them and grind, grind um, the seeds yourself, like in a, a coffee grinder that's dedicated to spices. So I'm adding my cumin and just letting this heat up a little bit just to kind of bring the natural oils of uh, the cumin out and so that it can blend in with uh, our ground chicken and uh, our vegetables. And it smells really good. For those of you that are cooking, 
Walt, do you think it smells good? Oh, yes. Yes, he's mm -hmm. thumbs up from Walt. Okay, I let's just let me double check where we are. I haven't added um, my garlic. Uh, so I said to press your garlic. Um, you could also use a microplane and you could go ahead and just grate that into um, your ground chicken mixture. And I'm going to just adjust my heat. I'm almost ready to add my um, chicken stock here. Okay, so we're going to add to um, some tomato paste. I love tomato paste in the tube. You can just eyeball like a tablespoon and then put the lid on and then it goes in the fridge and it keep, keeps indefinitely. It's so much easier to use than um, buying those little cans of um, tomato paste. And this is just going to add a nice flavor. Tomato paste is made where they cook down tomatoes, they strain them, they cook them down even further into a concentrate. So you just have a nice deep red color and also a nice deep tomato flavor. So a little bit goes a long ways. I'm going to go ahead and add my salt to this before I add my chicken stock. And then we'll add a little bit of pepper. Okay. And so then we're gonna go ahead and add our chicken stock to this. So we have a couple different things going on here. And two, I don't know if your pan looks like mine, but I've got the chicken still isn't brown, but I've got some just from probably like the onions because there's a lot of natural sugars in the onions. I've got some nice caramelization going on here or fawn brown bits on the bottom of the pan. That's going to come up when I add my chicken stock and it's going to add a little bit of flavor. So we're going to add at this point about a half a cup of your chicken stock. We're probably going to have to add a little bit more, but the things that I want to accomplish here is I want the potatoes and carrots to cook through, but at the same time, I want my filling to be nice and thick. I want all this liquid to evaporate. So I'm going to start with half a cup and then we'll add a little bit more, but I'll probably end up using about three quarters, three quarters of a cup. And the reason why you want your filling really thick is that when you go to fill your empanadas, if the filling's kind of soupy, it's not going to be fun to work with um, the pastry and the filling. So, you want this to really tighten up. And you can let this go at a pretty good clip where uh, it's simmering away. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, we'll have our chicken stock standing by. In your recipe, it says about 15 minutes, but I think this will only take about 10 since we cut our um, carrots and potatoes. Uh, in fairly small pieces. And then I have a couple of tasting spoons. We'll taste for seasoning as well as um, just uh, tenderness on the uh, carrots and the uh, potatoes. So I'm going to clear my space here. And then you need to have a baking sheet standing by. I lined mine with um, some parchment paper because once this um, is done, we're going to spread it out on our baking sheet and put it in the refrigerator so it has a chance to cool down because you want that filling 
to be fairly cold. Um, it's just going to make it a lot easier to work with your empanadas. Hot filling and cold pastry dough um, aren't, aren't a good match. And I'm going to go ahead and just wipe up uh, my onion here so that I have a clean board to work with. Jill, if you want to grab a board scraper. I know. Yeah, <laughs> that's been driving me crazy. Um, I know, it's driving me crazy. Do you know where I they're know. I was like, why didn't I grab one when I was back there? So I'm going to run back and grab a board scraper. It's pro probably, um, I won't even, well, I could use it for Timmy Curry. I'm going to add, I'm going to go ahead and add another quarter cup of liquid chicken stock to my chicken filling, okay? And you may need to do the same thing. I'll be right back. But did she just say, I'm sorry, when you over that? Oh, she's gonna go grab a, oh, she added a, a quarter cup more uh, broth to the filling. Okay, board scraper. So we still have um, our cilantro to work with. So I asked you to go ahead and wash that and uh, remove the leaves from the stems. And then we're just gonna give this a nice chopped. Um, when chopping herbs, I use kind of a forward motion with my knife. If you have a bigger knife, you are able to cover more surface area, and then you can bring what you're chopping together with a board scraper. To go ahead and chop your, your herbs. So cilantro is kind of interesting. It too, it's a member of the parsley family. But I was reading has a pungent flavor. I love cilantro, but about a third, third of the population does not like the flavor of cilantro. They think that it tastes like soap. So you will run across people that aren't big fans of um, cilantro. And it's used in a lot of uh, Latin American cooking. So that looks good. You're gonna be reserving your cilantro, you can go ahead and put it in a little mise en place bowl. And we're going to be adding that to our filling once it's cooled down. And I'm stirring my filling again. My The liquid, the chicken stock has evaporated again. I'm going to take a little test here. Um, to see how my potato and carrot are coming along. They're still a little bit al dente, so I'm gonna go ahead and add a little more of my stock. And at this point, I've actually added all of my chicken stock, all one cup of stock. And then I'm still scraping up some of those nice brown bits on the bottom of the pan, it's going to add a lot of flavor. There's a little bit of heat in this, Lori, from uh, the jalapeno pepper that I, I added, but it tastes I, good. Yeah, I love it. I love spicy. Um, your 30 minute timer just went off. Okay, that's okay. We're cool. Um, our pastry can be in the refrigerator. Thank you for um, just a little bit longer. We'll keep working on our are filling. So I have my cilantro waiting for me. While we're waiting for our filling to finish, I wanted to talk just a little bit about empanadas. So empanadas, they have their origins um, both in Portugal and Spain, but it's actually thought that empanadas are derived from the meat-filled pies, Arabic meat-filled pies. Um, so that was the influence, actually, the samosas um, for empanadas uh, in Spain and Portugal. 
And then it was again through Spanish exploration that um, empanadas were brought over to uh, Latin uh, America. And empanadas, they can range in size from like family size empanadas to as small as about a ravioli size uh, pastry. They're sweet or savory. Uh, for savory, it would be meat filled with vegetables like where we're doing today, or you, the sweet empanadas are usually filled with fruit. I've made empanadas with crushed pineapple and brown sugar and dried cherries. Well, I've also made pumpkin empanadas where you have a little brown sugar and warm spices, kind of like, um, kind of tastes like a pumpkin pie. Uh, and those are delicious. Uh, if you wanted some vegetarian options, uh, I have made uh, manchego cheese, olive and tomato paste empanadas. I've even made an empanada with uh, black beans, a little bit of plantains and jack cheese. And that was really good. So you can um, kind of take a look around uh, for different recipes. Um, this actually seems to be uh, my favorite and also my family's favorite too. So we have a tradition in our house. And I was telling Lori, I was excited about doing empanadas in um, December. I know our holidays are gonna be a little different this year, but we're always the house where everybody comes to um, for you know our holidays and family celebrations. So what we um, started doing um, instead of having like hors d'oeuvres and Christmas dinner, having all this food in one day, we split it apart. So on Christmas Eve, we have kind of like a potluck hors d'oeuvre party. We actually open our presents Christmas Eve. And then on Christmas Day, everybody comes back in the afternoon and um, has Christmas dinner. But empanadas have become a tradition uh, that's what I'm always requested to make for our Christmas Eve um, uh, get together. And I was starting, I was making up an honest, I was starting to feel a little sad because, you know, we can't get together with our families. But I thought, well, shoot, the next best thing is I'll just make up an honest and just drop them off to my family here in Sacramento. Um, so that way they still get a little taste of um, our Christmas Eve uh, tradition even though we're not gonna have a chance uh, to uh, be together. All right, let's do one more taste. Are you guys taste, starting to taste to kind of see where you are? And I think I'm gonna be good. Oh. After tasting this filling, mine's pretty hot. but it's very well seasoned. And you can also really taste the cumin in this too, which is a really nice addition. So at this point, I think you're gonna like these, Lori. I'm excited. Oh, good. I like the fact that um, you want your filling to be well seasoned, and that means to have plenty of salt because you want that bite to pop, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, it really, really does. Okay, so you can see, see my filling where I don't have a lot of liquid. Okay, that's what you're going for. So the, the chicken stock is pretty much cooked off and the potatoes and carrots are tender. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this on my sheet pan. And I'm gonna spread this out so it's an even layer. I really I want this to cook down or cook down. I want this cool. to chill down, cool down fairly fast. So if I spread it out, it will. And then you'll need to make room in your refrigerator for this to go in. And I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Jill, if you want, when you go back, you want to just soak that? You know, just yeah, soak I'll mouth. set it on the stove for yeah. now, and then I'll take it back. I'm going to have my cilantro here on the side, and that's going to remind me 
that I need to add that when we come back to um, our ground chicken filling. All right, so our people about where I am so that your filling is going in, I see. Gordon, thumbs up, who's no? Let's see. Um, I like Rachel, are you drinking wine? Yes. For you. <laughs> I, I know. I was watching Rachel the whole time. I'm like, I think she's drinking wine. Good for you. That's the I'm way. Jealous. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I finished the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Probably why my veggies are still uncooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, take your time. Okay, I'm going to put this in the fridge. We'll we'll just take a couple minutes to to let people um, get caught up. Um, and then we'll, um, I have a few more things I can cover. Um, the next thing we'll want to do is uh, roll out our pastry. So just make sure your surface is nice and clean. I'm going to roll out on my cutting board here. So I need to, to clean it off so that when you roll out your pastry. Okay, I'll be back. Oh, I just remembered um, a little bit more about empanadas. So the name empanada comes from the Spanish verb empanar, which means to then coat or wrap in uh, pastry. So just so you know, we um, our next step will be to roll out our dough that we made. Um, and we can talk about surfaces to roll on. At home, I have a granite island. So that, that's what I roll out on. What I like is I have a lot of surface area to work on. You could use marble. You know, today I'm just using a wooden cutting board. That's perfectly fine. When uh, we were doing in-person classes, we usually would have like about 16 people. We would um, have done like apple pie workshops where everybody makes their own apple pie. And we would just gather around our big island here at the Learning Center. I don't know if our countertop, is this granite, Lori? So we... Um I'm not sure, but I know it works really yeah, well. Yeah, it works really well. So we would just use that surface yeah, to roll on. Like bay leaves, which is probably over in that section where I grabbed the turmeric. Um, we could definitely use bay leaves. Sorry, that was my... Oh. <laughs> that was my walkie-talkie going off. So what, we, uh, Joe, what ahead. other surfaces could we use? Could we use parchment paper or with a flower or tile, like tile, regular? Yeah, if you have a smooth tile, um, okay. we have tables here that we would also use too if we had a really big class. I think, you know, just like a flat surface, but sometimes the granite or especially the marble, it can be a cooler surface, which is nice because then it helps to keep your pastry cold. And then as far as uh, rolling pins, I use what's referred to as a ball bearing rolling pin. Um, a lot of people really like the French tapered rolling pins. I think as far as what you want to use is just a rolling pin that will get the job done. So whatever you feel comfortable with. I think uh, people, I'm so used to this kind that this is what I gravitate to. But the um, French tapered rolling pins, I think people feel they have a little more control uh, when rolling. So um, those are also very good as well. And then we also, I don't think I said this, we need a little bench flower. So you need your rolling pin, a surface to roll on, bench flower. Um, you're going to need 
a scoop. You don't have to have a scoop like this. It's probably about two teaspoons worth of filling um, that we're gonna be using for our empanadas. So having that ready, I have a three inch cutter. And then once we roll out the dough, you can use a table knife or an offset spatula. You might need that to then uh, pick up the dough to put on our baking sheet. I'm gonna have us um, roll out the dough into a big circle and then use our three inch cutter. Um, we'll put our dough circles on our baking sheet. We'll have put those in the refrigerator. It never hurts to let our pastry rest a little more. I think it's almost easier to shape the empanadas if you've cut out your dough circles and let them have a chance to chill just, just a little bit uh, longer. I'm gonna show you a technique as far as working with the scraps from your pastry that works really well. You can re-roll once. After that, the pastry then um, just is kind of overworked and you're not gonna get the same flaky texture uh, that you're going for. In your recipe, I have um, for you rolling, shaping, and baking empanadas. Um, there's two different methods to use. Uh, you can also take your disc and cut it into wedges, cut it into pieces, and then roll one empanada at a time. I wanted to do it this way because I'll also be able to offer you some tips and techniques if say you made this dough and you decided you wanted to make a pie um, as far as rolling it out evenly. Um, and we'll discuss that uh, as we go when we're, we start rolling out our pastry. No yawning. <laughs> Poor Walt's getting a little bored. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing you. <laughs> I'm just teasing, I made that up. Anyway, okay. Um, in your recipe, it says to that disc of dough, to cut it into eight pieces. I almost think you could try, I'm thinking we're gonna get about 16 empanadas, three inch empanadas out of this recipe. You could just try cutting this into 16 wedges and then one piece at a time roll out a three inch circle. You won't have any pastry scraps, but that's kind of nice. Um, you have to roll dough out 16 times, but um, it might be a, a just a method that, that you would wanna, wanna go ahead and try. So are we able to move on to start rolling out our dough? Is every, yeah, with Gordon's thumbs up. Is there anybody who's not ready? Speak up. Mom's ready, okay. Okay, yeah. All right, All right Janice. Okay, Janice. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go get my dough um, out of the refrigerator. I love watching Gordon and his partner cook. <laughs> you guys got it going on. Is that Janice? No, I was talking oh. to Gordon. Oh, okay. I, I love, yeah, there. you guys are fun to watch. Oh, thank you. That's great. <laughs> We're having a great time. And Jan Janice has a nice friend with her. Oh, yeah. Janice, that's her husband, Roger. Oh, Janice, that's nice. Okay, so I sprinkled a little bit of flour on my board. Don't go too crazy. And then here's my disc of dough. Oh, another little thing I learned is you can take your dough and kind of roll the edges and just kind of press firmly and that just helps to kind of seal the edges so that as you roll this out, the edges don't crack. So we'll see how we do. So you can try that little tip. Okay, little flour on top. Have my rolling pin. You want a firm, steady pressure. You're gonna be rolling from the center out, okay? Firm, steady pressure, 
center out and as you roll periodically you're going to pick up the dough and do a quarter of a turn and as you're doing that if you find you need a little more flour underneath you can hit the board with a little more flour by doing turning this the dough periodically a quarter of a turn it helps to make sure that the dough doesn't stick and that also you have a more uniform shape, um, a circular shape. And that's a little more important um, if you're rolling this out for uh, a pot that you want, you're trying to maintain a circular shape. Okay, so firm, steady pressure to get started. I find too, when I'm starting out, I kind of use my hands to press this in to maintain a circular shape. Firm, steady pressure. I'm gonna turn. And you should be able to see little flecks of butter in your dough. I think the term was the butter is visible in your dough was brought up earlier. I'm still kind of using my hands to help maintain that circular shape, make sure that I don't have cracks on the edges. Firm, steady pressure. And this is the perfect day here to be inside baking, isn't it? And if your dough is nice and cold like this, I think you're finding this dough is pretty easy to work with and you don't need a ton of flour. If you add a lot of flour, it can also make the dough a little tough. And what you're going for here is about a quarter of an inch thick. Yay, Janice. Good job, Janice. She's a, she's a pro at pie dough. She's been making it for, oh, good for you. many, many years. We won't, right. we won't tell them how old you are, Mom. <laughs> well, she looks so young, like you, Lori. Oh, thank you. I have a little cilantro on my board there. OK, so I'm going to keep turning a quarter of an inch thick. If you're making a pie, I go a little thinner where it's an eighth of an inch thick. A little more flour and turn this. I'm gonna put a little flour on top here. There we go. I'm gonna turn one more time and I'm almost there. I'm thinking that looks pretty darn good. So you have a nice piece of pastry to work with. Turn one more time. Okay, so now I'm ready to start cutting out my dough circles. So I'm gonna just start on the edge and work my way around. And if I'm lucky, I might get 12. It may only be 11. So if you wanted to, you could make six inch circles. So you'd have bigger empanadas. Uh, the thing is, is um, if you like a more, more filling to pastry ratio, if you do the six inch empanadas, you probably get about a quarter cup of um, the filling. Now I love crust, pizza crust, pastry crust. 
So I appreciate having a higher pastry to filling uh, ratio with the uh, smaller empanadas. So I'm gonna cut away some of my scraps. If you're finding you have some scraps, please don't take your scraps and ball, you know, take them and make it into a dough ball. Just cut them away and put them to the side. And I'll show you a technique that you can use that'll keep uh, the scraps of dough really nice and tender and flaky to use. Now you may find too, the center tends to be a little thicker and I can tell that my center is a little bit thicker than my edges were. So I'm going to roll this just a little bit so that it's not quite as thick. I want that about a quarter of an inch thickness. I'm going to try to get two more out of this. I don't think I'm going to get three. Can I do it? Aha, there. And then I think I'm just going to have to go in the middle here. Okay, so how many did I get? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And so out of the scraps, you'll probably get four or five more. So how are folks doing out there? You got, okay, Gordon and they are doing well. Good. Um, Looks like, I think Kathy has a different technique. Okay. Am I right, Kathy? <laughs> doing a different technique? Yeah. I think she's I'm making, doing. I'm ahead. making big ones. I'm making big ones. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to get six. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And then save your scraps because you'll be able to get a couple okay. more. So okay. I'm starting to take my scraps, I just have strips of scraps and I'm overlapping them. You can cut some of the pieces so that they're about the same size. And then you're gonna need a piece of uh, plastic wrap. So you're going to put your scraps on top of the plastic wrap. You can sprinkle just a tiny bit of flour over the top and then take another piece. And I'm going to take my rolling pin and roll this so that the pieces kind of adhere to one another. And then a technique, this is actually used to like make croissants or puff pastry. I have kind of like a long rectangular shape here. I'm going to do what's called a business fold. I'm going to fold this in thirds. So I'm bringing the bottom part up and then the top part down. And that'll create some extra layers here. so that my scraps are going to be, the dough's going to be still flaky. And then go ahead and cover it back up. 
and roll it again. And then we'll let that chill. And later you'll have some filling left over. Once this has had a chance to chill, you'll be able to make a few more empanadas to bake off. And you can even freeze these too. I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to make pies and if with the dough scraps, you know how you would um, put cinnamon and sugar on them and bake them in the oven. It was so good. Oh, Jill, I have a question. Um, I think Skip was, he only has seven. He says, what went wrong? Huh? You only have seven. Do you think, did what you size round? He answering? Oh, here he is. Hey, Skip, what size round did you use? Was it three inch? Four inches. Okay. So yours are a little bigger. And then was your dough a quarter of an inch thick, would you say? Oh, um, Skip, if you could unmute. I would say it's probably about an eighth of an inch thick. Okay, so a little thinner. All right. I think it's just because you're using um, a bigger cutter. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put my pastry into the refrigerator. Let's just kind of check where we are. Um, once you get your pastry in the refrigerator, if you're going to be baking off your empanadas, now is a good time to start preheating your oven to 425 degrees. You want the oven rack to be in the middle of um, the oven. And then that way the oven has a chance to, to heat up nicely to bake off your empanadas. So I'll be right back. Janice? Uh, yeah, a question about baking. Uh, is it something that you should eat at room temperature or is it better to eat empanadas when they're hot out of the oven? I think when they're hot out of the oven. And so if you um, aren't ready to eat those, what, um, what, what we're doing is the ones she made, we're going to put those in the fridge because I'm going to bake them off later tonight. Oh, good. So okay. after you make your empanadas, however many you want to eat tonight, put those in the fridge. And then if you have extras, you can put those in the freezer. Yeah, and then she'll talk. Oh, Jill will I'm, talk about. Just yeah, you can even like I've been. I wanted to revisit this recipe, so I made some empanadas for Walt and I, and like Lori, I made enough just for our dinner. But I still have some dough and filling in the refrigerator, so I can make I can make some more, shape them tomorrow and bake them off tomorrow. Or like what Lori was saying, you can shape them and freeze them. And then you go from the freezer to the oven when you bake them off 400 degrees for about a half an hour. And I, I did include that suggestion um, in your, your recipe packet. Um, if they're already baked, um, you can, if you want to warm them up, because I really like them warm, just put them in about a 300 degree oven for about five minutes just to, to warm them up. Um, and then you can nibble on them that way too. And these are great for a party. I always, I bake them and then I have this beautiful basket and there's a place to have the chimichurri in the middle and bring it, bring it over. But they're, they're delicious hot, but they're good, good at room temperature too. That way, that's why this uh, recipe is nice where you can have it on a or dirt, dirt table where people can just be helping themselves. All right, I think it's time to make some chimichurri and then we'll be able to start shaping our empanadas. And I'm gonna, at that point when Walt talks about some wine, I might join Rachel in a little sip of wine. Mm -hmm. um, so our chimichurri, 
go ahead and grab your ingredients. So this is just a thick herb sauce. It's actually really popular um, in Argentina. Uh, they kind of use chimichurri like we would use ketchup here uh, in the United States. You don't have to have a Vitamix to make this recipe, just a regular blender would work perfectly fine. Uh-oh. What? It's not gonna reach. Oh, it's right there. There's, no, 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 Jill, underneath, ah. it's wrapped around. You just have to ah. unwrap it. Are you sure? Yeah, because I just, okay. I, I used it. it. The other way. Got it, got it. Lori, thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Jill? Yeah. I can think I you use a mini prep prep too. Yes. Oh, can I use a mini prep or is that too small? Should I use a blender? I don't know. I'll I can try it. I just, okay, I'll, I'll use a blender. I just. Okay. okay. Just to be on the safe side, I've never used a mini prep. So, all right. Are you able to turn that? Yeah. I okay. Think. Yeah, I got it now. I'm good. I'm good. All right. So this is a recipe like Walt helps me with empanadas. Um, I usually have him help me like pick off all the, the, the parsley and the cilantro and the oregano off of the stems. And we'll show you too. Um, we have a good little system as far as working together um, to assemble um, our empanadas. So I guess the point is, is this is kind of a a fun recipe to do with other people too. Um, and I've even invited girlfriends over where um, I've made the dough and the filling and then we just kind of hang out and shape the empanadas, drink wine, bake them off, munch on empanadas. So, so that's a fun thing to do too. So basically in this recipe, if you have your ingredients, mise en place, you're just adding everything except for the olive oil. So we have three tablespoons of cilantro. So we have some repeat ingredients here, like the cilantro. We have that also for our empanada filling. We're using some um, flat leaf parsley, three tablespoons. We're using only one tablespoon of oregano, just because oregano has such a pungent flavor Oregano, um, the name actually means joy of the mountain in um, Greek. And I was reading too, um, oregano didn't become popular here in the United States until after World War II. So it was uh, American soldiers who had assignments in Italy came back to the United States and they were just raving about how good oregano was. They were probably eating a lot of pizza and tomato sauce with oregano. So that's when oregano um, started to become more commonly known here in the United States. Um, we're using some more cumin. We have a couple cloves of garlic that I've just um, smashed and peeled. A little bit of salt. We're using one quarter of a white onion. Then we have two tablespoons we're using a really nice, Lori got me um, a really nice uh, wine vinegar. This is Cats. Their vinegars and olive oils are just absolutely uh, wonderful. And I just want to point out, I don't know if everybody shopped at the co-op. I know um, Lori's mom did it because she lives in another state. But um, all of the ingredients that we're using today um, came from the, the co-op we're adding our vinegar and then i have my i'm going to do a jalapeno pepper if you um didn't have another jalapeno pepper you could um, just add some uh, red pepper chili flakes if you want a little a, lo a little bit of heat and i don't necessarily use a glove when i'm removing the rib and the seeds i just find that like the tip of a paring knife does a really good job. And this um, jalapeno pepper was a little bit bigger. I think I'm gonna just add half of it, Lori. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put the lid on here and we'll turn this on. 
to start chopping our ingredients. And then it says a quarter of a cup. Sometimes you need a little bit more to kind of bring this together. We'll see how we do. And when I'm making like a pesto or a salad dressing or like our chimichurri, I like to use what I consider like a good quality olive oil. Um, and then I'll save my olive oil that's a little bit less expensive uh, for cooking because kind of the idea is that heat will um, break down the flavor of um, the olive oil. So I'm gonna add just, I think a little bit more here to bring this together. That looks really good. Um, so can you see kind of the, the consistency here? It's pretty thick. Um, that looks delicious. I'm going to give it just uh, a little taste. Let me grab a tasting spoon. That's really good. So perfect. So this is something you definitely can make ahead. And it's actually a little better if it has a chance to uh, hang out a little bit for the flavors to come together. And this sauce just kind of feels Christmassy too, just the nice green, green color. Okay. And Jill, you have uh, 20 minutes. Okay, we'll do it. All right, our chimichurri's done. I, we made tri-tip the other night, so um, I made empanada, or I made chimichurri the day before, so we had chimichurri worth our tri-tip, and then the next day I made the empanadas, and then we had our chimichurri already made to go with the empanadas. All right, I'm gonna set this aside. I did bake some ahead. I'll show you in just a little bit what they look like when they're baked. So let's go ahead and clear. And I'm gonna show you then how to assemble our empanadas. And what we thought we would do is as we're assembling, then um, Walt can talk about the two wines yeah we selected yes I have, I have a question did anybody purchase the wine that was suggested on the shopping list oh gordon and how good company. yay we liked them both okay. so when we had our empanadas um this is the fun part of being um a cooking instructor is that then we we had to sample the empanadas and then we tried the sparkling wine and the Grenache. Um, so we did kind of a side-by-side -side tasting and we liked them both. Um, and it was fun to have both with the empanadas um, so that you uh, have two different wines that you're sampling that both go perfectly well with um, what you're serving. So I'm gonna go get the filling and my dough circles, okay? And this is where you're gonna need like a little scoop for the filling and you're gonna need your egg wash. That was like, I think from the very, the, 
the uh, recipe for the um, pastry dough was to have a little bit of egg wash. So they'll need a pastry brush for the egg wash, right? Or I'll show, I just use my finger. Oh, perfect. I'm saying egg wash, sorry. It's actually an egg white. It's just an egg white. Sorry, I didn't mean to confuse anybody. You need an egg, egg white. Jill, if yeah. they don't have a scoop, could somebody just use a tablespoon or a scant it's tablespoon? Easy. It's like kind of a scant tablespoon. Um, I'll show you too. You'll see, you may um, want to start with like just a, a teaspoon you would use on your table. One thing you want um, to be careful of is uh, you don't want to overfill either because um, then it makes it hard to seal uh, the empanada. So I'll be right back. Yeah, you can What's that? Um, you can step in and just show them. Hello, how are we doing? Hi, Walt. All right, so we're going to start off here with a, a, a rose cava. So this is a, just a little of little background on champagne and sparkling wine and cava. There's, they're, they have a lot in common. They're an effervescent wine. And uh, if you get into the technicalities of it, especially in France, the um, law there requires that in order to refer to it as a champagne, it has to come from the champagne district. And uh, there are also are, are quite a bit of, there's, there's a lot of volume of sparkling wine sold in France from outside those areas and, and those that's called Cremant. So California, we call it sparkling wine, although a lot of people just you know casually call it champagne. There's, there's no law you're breaking by doing that, but it, 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 if you're unaware of this, it's, it's a good little body of knowledge to have. And in Spain, they call it cava. So cava comes from an area called Catalonia. So it's kind of the uh, southern, the uh, southeastern part of the country. So you're, you're, the big city there is Barcelona. So you, you, you have the Mediterranean Sea, and then you have mountains that rise fairly quickly from the ocean, and uh, really beautiful area, really. And, and the, uh, the climate there is much like California. So anyway, I'll go ahead and open this. This is Navarone. This actually is a, a family yeah, that dates back to 1901, wow. so it, it has a lot of history. So I'm just going to have you show them how to open it at this point. Okay. But I like show them like that. It always takes. Okay. I don't want to steal your thunder. Yeah, I don't steal my thunder. I want I want to do this part. So it, you know, when you, you take off the uh, the uh, cage at the top of, of bubbly, you turn. And it's always the same number of turns. Anybody want to guess how many turns it is? And, I, and when I say turns, I mean full, full turns. Three. Three. Six. Mm. So anyway, now this is kind of a, you, you know, you, you watch the, uh, you, you watch the World Series or the Super Bowl and the winning team, they, you know, they have the cameras come into the locker room and, you see the teammates shooting off, basically turning a cork into a projectile. So it's fun to do that just to keep as long as you're not, you know, you aim it appropriately. But actually the better thing to do is to just let it out nice and easily because you do lose a lot of effervescence when you, when you shoot it out like that. So the hard way to do this is to try to hold the bottom and turn like this. The better thing to do you have a bigger area to work with. Just grip the top part, turn ever so slightly from the bottom. You have a much better grip on the bottom and then ever so gently let it out. So it's just like a little fizz type of a sound. And uh, you preserved a lot of that nice effervescence. So do you want me to show pour a glass and show the, the color of it? I think on, let us start assembling okay. and then you'll be able to um... Very good. To talk and interrupt it. Okay, so Jill's taking back over. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. That was kind of fun to learn. I wanted them to see um, you opening. Okay, yay. We get to assemble our empanadas. 
And I'll do one and then I'll, I'll show you too the little system that Walt and I have. Um, so you're going to take one of your dough circles and I just find it easier to use my finger with the egg white and that's going to be kind of like your glue. And I'm taking a little bit of egg white just around the bottom half of my dough circle. It's good to have a towel or a paper towel so that you can wipe off your finger. You don't want too much because if you get too much, it kind of defeats the purpose. It actually won't seal that well. Then I take my filling and I scoop it into the middle. And I'll show you about about like that. So I would say that's like a little less than a tablespoon of filling. Then you're gonna take your circle. Sometimes I have to press down the filling with my finger a little bit. And you're gonna bring it together so the edges are flush and just start pinching the edges together. And I find it's a little easier to go ahead and make all my little turnovers and then come back and crimp the edges. So I'll make my, my empanada, set that on the baking sheet and continue. Then once I've filled all of these, I'll come back and crimp. So do you wanna come in here? Why don't you just, uh, I'll do another, wash your, wash your hands. Uh, where I have Walt come in and help me. So I'll fill and then I'll hand the pastry over to him. Here's a towel. And then he's the one that will then seal the empanada. And a certifiable pincher. Yeah, yes. So, there you go. <laughs> but it, may, it makes it fun to have a little bit of help and sometimes you're like under the gun if you're entertaining to get these done before everybody arrives. So I'll do one more and then I'll show you how to crimp. And I added my cilantro. When Walt was talking, I stirred in my uh, cilantro. So there you go. And then I need to grab a fork. I'll, let me go grab that. Walt is a pro at this. He is. So then you can go back and just take the tines of a fork and go around the edges to help seal your empanadas. So then once you have all of these assembled, you can go ahead, you can do a couple different things. You can bake these off, or if you want to slide them back in the refrigerator, you can go ahead and work on making some more empanadas with your dough scraps and then bake everything off together. I mean, you can easily get um, 16 empanadas onto one sheet. I think I can actually get 24. And then the nice thing about this pastry, it browns so beautifully. You don't need an egg wash. You don't need to egg wash these um, before going into the oven. So I'm going to continue working on my empanadas, and you guys can do the same. And Walt will talk about the wines. OK, so we'll take a little bit up where we left off with the kava. So you know, we originally wanted to come up with a, a lighter wine and a red wine as a as items we could pair. So empanadas are they have a very strong flavor, and uh, red is is a slam dunk. So I mean we'll we'll get to that. That's that's going to be next. But um, it's, it's very easy. You can have a lot of you, you have a wide spectrum of reds that you can use to taste with empanadas. Whites not so much. 
there's there's some limitations on whites and uh, you know some of the Sauvignon Blancs. Even there, you have to be particular. There are different styles of Sauvignon Blancs that that can have um, you know if it's a little too earthy, it's going to kind of throw off the flavor profile and they'll compete with each other rather than hold hands, so to speak. So you know one one uh, kind of wine, one one that style of wine that really it, it's incredibly versatile is, is rosé. So I thought about why not go with a, a cava, a Spanish cava. So you, you have a Spanish theme and a Spanish wine to go with it. And uh, it's a rosé cava. And this is actually a very, it, it's a little more time on the skins of Pinot Noir grapes. So it's about 60% Pinot Noir grapes. And uh, the other other 40% is called Pieda, I believe is the pronunciation. There's Pieda, Macabo and Zarello. Those are, are white varietals that are you find in Spain. So whereas in France, you have a lot of times it's Chardonnay or sometimes they use even like Chenin Blanc or some other white varietals in, in areas outside the Champagne district and to make Cremant and um, even Pinot Blanc as you get up into Alsace. So these are, are Spanish varietals, and so there, there are actually some, some characteristics that are unique. And so this has a very nice strawberry kind of a note to it. And I'm going to grab some white paper. It's, uh, there's so many things in the background to distract your eye from the color. But as you see there, it's kind of a, a dark salmon. So it it's, uh, has a nice mousse on the nose. It's a strawberry, a little bit of citrus. And, and uh, you know, there's a big long sentence can describe the different conditions for where a grape grows and, and the harvesting. So it can go from the soils to you know, the weather patterns from a, a year, typical climate and uh, elevation, marine influences. French have a single word for that and it, it's called uh, terroir. So uh, that's, this has a little bit, you find the European wines tend, tend to have a little bit more minerality than if you're buy a California wine. They're, they're, that's, that's not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, it's a little bit of a flavor note that you see a lot more from, from the old world wines, meaning wines from Europe. So this is a nice full body that it, it kind of opens up and then uh, has a nice balance of effervescence. It has, it, it's, it has a, a big body in the, in the sense of how it fills and fills out in, in your mouth. You can enjoy this by itself. You can just, this is a great single, you know, just stand up at a cocktail party and uh, let's say the, uh, the orders haven't shown up yet, and, but you can really enjoy this. It doesn't have to be something that you, you enjoy it more once you pair with it. That having been said, it pairs beautifully with empanadas. I mean, some, it has just an, the acidity to it just cuts right through and you're, you have a, you know, a lot of flavor coming through with the empanadas and the chimichurri too. So uh, anyway, this is the grapes for this wine are, are grown at altitude, some altitude. It's, it's uh, I believe about 1300 feet. So not too far from the ocean, kind of near the Pyrenees mountains. That's a, a tall mountain range that separates the, uh, the country of Spain from the country of France. And uh, anyway, the, if you watch the Tour de France, there, there's a segment of that where it's a really punishing series of switchbacks. So they're, they're substantial mountains. The, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, climate in that part of Spain is not that dissimilar to California. So there's, you can get downright hot there. And so the elevation helps a little bit. So the, the, uh, it, it helps with the grapes. So anyway, um, did, did anybody buy this? I, I guess that's been asked already, but I, was, I wasn't here for that. Uh, Gordon and um, his partner did, yes. Did oh, you good. guys like it? What do you think? Thumbs up? Yeah, we liked it very much. Oh, good, good. It, it's, you know, it's, it's around 17, I think it's 17.99, so it's a really good deal. Yeah, I mean, the prices of, of champagne, I mean, the champagne from France is generally you're, you're looking $30 and up and, you know, well over $100, in some cases over $200. And uh, 
California sparkling wines or something similar to this, you'd be probably looking in the $28, $35 range. So it's, it's a really good value. And uh, so really happy to have it out here to, to be able to pair it. Where, did, where can you buy that from? Well, it, we, we got it here at the co-op. So yep, we, at uh, the co-op. <laughs> both of the wines we mentioned here are available at the co-op. Okay. And um, that's that's where it, that'd be my first place to look. It's it's a fairly well-known name, so you, you know it, it, it's uh, if you can't find it at the co-op, then there there are other alternatives online. So uh, as far as any other stores in the area, I, I wouldn't really know. Um, okay, so I, I want to shift gears a little bit and move into the red. Is, is that good timing? It is. Okay. Um, yeah, in Walt, we um, we have about four minutes. Okay. And All then right. we have to wrap it up. All right, very good. Okay, Zestos. This is this is a Grenache. So does Grenache sound a little bit like Grenache? If you've, you've heard of Grenache before from France. There's there's a reason. It's the same variety. It's just a different area of growing, and so. It's uh, the, the uh, Spanish name is Garnacho. This is grown almost 2,000 feet. It's a family that's been in the business since 1950. So the vines are old and they were planted in 1950, between 1950 and 1970. So why is that important, the old versus new? Well, Grenache, Grenache, they are, they are a, a grape that their the vines are very robust. They usually overproduce in fruit, so that has to be managed carefully. As a, as the vine gets older, you know, it gets a little more gangly, and they become a little more miserly as far as, as how, how much fruit they put out. And so it doesn't become such a problem, and the fruit has a nice concentration of sugars, just enough, and the heat there kind of generates uh, just the right balance for that. In France, the, oftentimes you've heard of Cote de Rhone wines or Chateauneuf de Pop is, is the higher end of that. And, then, and they use Grenache over there as a, a blending. There's also Movedra and Syrah. So Syrah also, and if, if it's popular in California, if it is in uh, Australia, they call it Shiraz. And uh, so Grenache is, it's a little lighter color you might be able to see my finger on the other side of that. Just barely. I know that it's a little, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't, I don't know if I can do this. That might make a difference. I guess the point here that's important to make is this is slightly lighter when you compare it with a Syrah. And uh, Syrah is really inky, and really, it, you would not be able to see your finger holding on the other side of the glass. But it has a nice, robust strawberry character with a little minerality. And uh, it's fantastic. It, it, it has a lot of complexity. So the way this pairs, the way this wine pairs with the empanadas that Jill's making up, uh, I just, you know, I, I, it was hard to stop. One, I was, you know, we always do eating or drinking. Both, because <laughs> <laughs> we, we we pair these together. So I get to be the guinea pig, and which is always, I, I I do the dishes and I provide the wine. So it's a team effort, and uh, that's a great marriage. Yeah. It is. It is <laughs> more than one way. Great for COVID too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So so now this is eleven dollars and ninety nine cents. Um, you know the length of a wine. That's or the complexity. Sometimes I mean you, you have to look at red wines in California and you, you realize the prices have just gone through the roof. And so you know question often comes up: How can I find something that's really inexpensive, say $15, 10 to $15, or at most $20, something I can just enjoy casually. I don't have to go out and figure out spending 30 to $40, or, or in some cases, much more. And this, usually when you, you buy lower end wines, they can taste good, but you, you don't, they don't have a long finish. They don't have complexity. This has complexity that I would say compares with wines that are around $30. So it's an, another incredible value at eleven ninety nine for wow. co-op. So I highly recommend it. Both these, both of these products here, I really highly recommend. So hopefully, I kept that within four minutes. Later. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Walt. It's always great to have you. Cheers, Walt. Cheers. You want to... It doesn't matter. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you, Rachel.
Rachel. <laughs> Great. Okay, Jill, so you're going to wrap it up. I am. So I just wanted to show you um, what the empanadas look like once they're baked off. And I have a little Christmas napkin and our beautiful chimichurri. And we have our lovely wines. And I just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. I think only one other thing I wanted to, to mention, if you find you have some filling left over and you're not going to make more empanadas, a couple different ideas. Um, my sister-in-law has used that filling for like a shepherd's pie. So mm -hmm. you would do like a, a mashed potato topping. Um, or I've also used it um, for breakfast as a hash. I think it's been a while. I think I added some roasted sweet potatoes to it and then, you know, cook that in a cast iron skillet, kind of get, you know, some, some brown on it and then crack open a couple of eggs and you slide that into the oven and let the, the eggs cook off. So you have um, a nice kind of breakfast hash too. Did Jill, there's a question, what about ah, tacos? Great idea, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that would be delicious. That would be whoever that was from. That was from Skip. Great idea. Okay, great idea. And I've been saying Rachel, is it Rochelle? Oh, Sorry. Rochelle. It's Rochelle. I just noticed. <laughs> All right. So does anybody have any questions? Do you feel good about making empanadas? I hope I hope uh, you make this uh, a tradition like like we have. Um, I was curious, how did the pastry come out? Um, the person that made it by hand. Did you feel good about the results that you got? Yeah. It, it, I mean, I guess I'll know when I taste it, but I've got them all, you know, they all seem. Oh, like, beautiful. They that seem looks good. <laughs> oh, good. Beautiful. Okay. All right. All right, everybody. Well, happy holidays. And hopefully we'll see you for future Zoom classes. I think Lori and I are hoping we can do um, 